At 44 years old, Cecilio Lopez had spent over two decades delving into the unknown, exploring caves and diving into their mysterious depths. His dedication to the Madrid Rescue Group for over 15 years earned him a reputation as one of Spain's foremost cave rescuers, a title he wore with pride. But it was not just the thrill of adventure that motivated Cecilio. It was the possibility of making history. He dreamed of discovering ancient artifacts and uncovering forgotten civilizations buried beneath the earth. Peru, with its uncharted caves and untold secrets, called to Cecilio like a siren song. He wanted to explore its deep, winding caverns to unravel the mysteries hidden within their rocky embrace. And so, when he heard of the Intimace Cave, rumored to hold extreme archaeological potential, he knew he had to see it for himself. Gathering a team of skilled explorers, Cecilio embarked on a journey to the remote cave site in northern Peru. The expedition was fraught with danger as they navigated narrow passageways and descended into abyssal depths. September 18, 2014 marked the final day of the exploration campaign, and Cecilia, along with two colleagues, embarked on a thrilling adventure to explore the deepest section of the Intimus Cave. This high-risk expedition required preparation, and they packed all their gear, including ropes and harnesses, and got moving. As they entered the cave, the scorching heat and humidity hit them like a wall. The team was covered in sweat as they climbed over the boulders and down the horizontal shaft. Cecilia leads the way in a sense of urgency. After reaching a central vertical shaft, they anchored themselves to the cave. They quickly get themselves down this section with no issues. However, it doesn't stop there as they plan to go further down the cave, allowing for more opportunities to explore. The team had made it very deep into the cave, and now they are at a depth of 1,300 feet. This part is uncharted, and the most dangerous section is right before them. Now they face the most perilous section of the cave, a narrow and treacherous passage that demanded their utmost attention. The team contorted their bodies through the tight tunnels, their focus divided between navigating the terrain and uncovering ancient secrets. Cecilia called for a brief halt before tackling the technical descent, allowing the team to rest and recharge. As they refocused on the challenge ahead, the team knew they had to overcome a technical descent before venturing deeper into the cave. The anchor point on the cave wall appeared sturdy, but the risk was palpable. If the anchor gave way, anyone attached would fall straight down at high speed into the rock pit below. This was the most dangerous part of the expedition. With his teammates help, Cecilia carefully set up the anchor, trying to make it as secure as possible. As he began his descent down the shaft, he suddenly heard a faint shift in the rock. His heart racing, he braced himself for the worst. The anchor pulled out and Cecilia fell 15 feet to the rocky cave floor, landing with a loud thud. Miraculously, he avoided the jagged rocks, but the impact sent excruciating pain coursing up his spine. He let out a deafening cry, his vision blurring as he struggled to comprehend the severity of his injuries. This was Cecilia's worst injury in 20 years of exploring, and it couldn't have happened in a more dreadful location. He had broken ribs and an incomplete fracture of his third lumbar vertebra, leaving him unable to move. The prospect of climbing out on his own was impossible. He was trapped. As the realization set in, Cecilia's terror turned to panic. He couldn't feel his legs, and the thought of being stranded in the depths of the cave was unbearable. One of Cecilia's teammates made his way down to him and was shocked by the situation. Cecilia was in a lot of pain and couldn't move. After a while, he started thinking about how he could be rescued. The team decided that one person would leave the cave to get help, while the other stayed with Cecilia. For five days, Cecilia lay on the cave floor, unable to move. He could only stare at a rock on the ceiling. Finally, a Peruvian medical team arrived and gave him morphine to ease the pain, but Cecilia still needed to be rescued and taken to a hospital. The problem was that Cecilia needed a special stretcher to protect him from further injury during the rescue. The stretcher had to be able to withstand the rough journey out of the cave. The team realized that getting help was going to be harder than they thought. The Spanish government initially refused to assist, so they turned to the Peruvian government and then the Madrid Calving Federation for help. Thanks to social media and the caving community, 
the Spanish government finally agreed to launch a rescue mission. A group of Cecilia's friends flew to Peru to rescue him, and soon hundreds of volunteers from all over Spain joined the effort. After days of preparation, the rescue operation began. A camp was set up outside the cave, and a massive rescue effort was planned. However, the remote location and harsh weather conditions, constant rain and 9,000 feet above sea level, posed significant logistical challenges. The team lacked essential supplies like food, water, communication equipment, and blankets. Despite these obstacles, the locals offered support and a priest even donated a cow for the rescue team to eat. International experts from Italy, France, Mexico, and 40 Peruvian soldiers and firefighters joined the rescue effort, led by a colonel from Peru's emergency management agency. Rescuers descended into the cave, explained the rescue plan to Cecilia, and set up a technical rope system to extract him safely. They established a camp 900 feet deep in the cave and spent 12 days preparing for the rescue. Cecilia remained immobilized and in pain at the bottom of the cave during this time. Finally, the rescue team used the extensive rigging system to extract Cecilia from the cave. A Peruvian Air Force helicopter transported him to a medical center in heavy winds. After months of complicated medical treatments, Cecilia made a full recovery and plans to continue exploring caves in the area. Brent Coven and six other cavers, led by Luca Carabini, planned an exciting adventure in Thunder Canyon Cave, hidden in eastern San Diego County. The cave is hard to find without insider knowledge, requiring a journey down a dirt road and a two-mile hike. Recent rains had turned the usually calm cave waters into a rushing torrent. Thunder Canyon Cave is known for its dark, tight passages, slippery ground, and sudden drops. Only the most daring cavers attempt it, using ropes and heavy chains to navigate its maze of boulders. Brent, a 39-year-old software engineer from Valley Center, California, meticulously planned his cave trips. His wife, Raina, supported him in all his adventures, including caving. On Sunday, May 3rd, 2010, Brent and his fellow cavers arrived at the cave site. They geared up and put on their wetsuits. The adventure started with a 45-foot rappel through a waterfall into a cold pool a thrilling descent Brent had eagerly anticipated. Next, they had to descend a rock face using a double rope, fixed to a boulder near the cave's opening. They planned to go downstream and then decide which part of the cave to explore next. Once down, most of the group felt relieved, but some were terrified. Luca, the guide, was glad everyone made it safely through this first big challenge. Steve, who went down second, got soaked and began shaking nervously. Luca asked if anyone wanted to turn back, but everyone decided to keep going. After setting up an 80-foot rappel, the group continued through the cave, crawling, climbing, and wading through icy water. They made two more rappels smoothly. By 3 p.m., they reached the terrible traverse, a crack that turns at a right angle and is only nine inches wide, requiring sideways movement. Someone had placed a wooden board across the gap to prevent cavers from sliding down and getting stuck. The crack extends vertically for 200 feet and is less than five minutes from the downstream end of the cave, their goal for the day. Brent, tired and achy, felt a rush of excitement at reaching this part of the cave for the first time. It was a personal challenge and a rare accomplishment in the caving world. Brent wanted to prove his advanced skills to himself and his fellow cavers. Luca went through the crack first to assist from the other side. Steve, feeling very cold and tired, went next but got stuck. This was his worst nightmare, as he was the least experienced in the group. After 10 minutes of pulling and pushing, they freed Steve, who was exhausted and traumatized. Realizing he was in over his head, he needed to leave the cave immediately. While Steve was freaking out, three morts got through the crack with no issues. Luca then escorted the other three to the exit, assuming Brent and Jim could handle themselves. Brent was second to last to go through the same aperture that had trapped Steve. Brent's heart raced as he faced this tight gap for the first time. He had to move his feet first down the crack, then shimmy sideways before dropping five feet to the floor of the next chamber. On Brent's first attempt, he felt he wouldn't make it, but Jim encouraged him to try. Not wanting to inconvenience anyone with a long trip back, 
Brent removed his wetsuit and tried again in just his t-shirt. His hips jammed, and he became completely stuck, with his face pressed against the cold rock wall. Luca returned and quickly sprang into action. He and Jim tried everything, but Brent was badly stuck. After about two hours, Brent started losing feeling in his arms and slid further into the crack, where the gap was only 8.5 inches wide. Jim tried to yank Brent out, but it was painful and not working. If Brent didn't get out, neither would Jim. The group shielded Brent with jackets and encouraged him to keep moving. In total darkness except for Jim's headlamp, Brent drifted in and out of a dreamlike state. Jim told stories to keep him awake. Luca, Steve, and Ben did everything they could to keep him warm. Luca finally reached the exit to get the rescue team involved. Four men entered the cave and discovered Brent had been trapped for almost six hours, and he was severely hypothermic. They strapped him into a harness, but he was too weak to climb out. They brought a sledgehammer to break up the rocks, wedging Brent. One inch at a time, they hammered away while Jim held Brent's hand and talked to him. Around 6.1 a.m., after nearly nine hours, Brent's harness finally loosened, and he was pulled out of the crack. The group dragged him to the cave's exit and made sure he was conscious. Exhausted, the rescue team took turns carrying him up the steep rock face. Brent was rushed to the hospital for severe hypothermia and dehydration. He was stable and expected to recover fully. In 2014, Darren Spivey, a 35-year-old scuba diving enthusiast, wanted to share his passion with his 15-year-old son, Dylan. On Christmas Eve, Darren gave Dylan scuba tanks as an early present. They were both excited to use them, planning a dive for the next morning. On Christmas morning, Darren and Dylan set out to a local dive site, but found the gate locked. Determined to dive, Darren decided to take them to another site in central Florida, located in a wildlife management area that was open to hunters, hikers, and divers all day. They drove to the park entrance and found it open. After suiting up in their wetsuits and scuba gear, they headed down a wooden walkway that led to a pond. As they walked down the wooden walkway, they passed several signs warning against diving in the pond unless you were an expert. This pond was the entrance to the infamous and dangerous eagle's nest, known as the Mount Everest of cave diving. At the bottom of this calm-looking pond was a narrow hole that led to a massive underwater cave system. Expert divers would follow a guideline down into the cave, swimming until the light above them faded into darkness. Once through the tunnel, divers entered a vast chamber called the ballroom. In this space, if you shined your light in any direction, you wouldn't see a wall. It was that enormous. Divers often said it felt like being in outer space. The guideline continued down to the bottom of the ballroom about 130 feet deep, where a sign with a grim reaper warned, stop, prevent your own death, do not go any further. This was the last easy point to turn back. Beyond this sign, the cave split into narrower tunnels, reaching depths of 300 feet. The dangers increased significantly beyond this point. A current ran through Eagle's Nest, which could blow divers off the guideline, making it nearly impossible to find the way out in the pitch black. Many divers had died attempting these dives. The sign was a stark warning against life-threatening risks. Despite these warnings, Darren and Dylan, standing at the end of the walkway, were ready to dive. Neither was an expert. Dylan wasn't even a certified diver, and this was one of his first dives. Before diving in, Darren texted his fiance, saying they were at Eagle's Nest and about to dive, promising to call when they surfaced. He then put his phone away, and they jumped into the water, swimming towards the cave entrance. Hours passed without a call from Darren. As the sun set, his fiance grew worried and drove to Eagle's Nest. Seeing Darren's car but no sign of them, she called the police. Professional divers were quickly dispatched to search the cave. The search divers descended into the tunnel and entered the ballroom, scanning the ceiling near the entrance with their flashlights. They soon found Dylan's lifeless body trapped against the ceiling, his emergency flotation devices inflated, his mouthpiece out, and his tanks empty. After retrieving Dylan's body, they continued down the guideline to the ballroom's bottom, where they found Darren on a sandy hill near the Grim Reaper sign, his mouthpiece out and tanks empty. 
both Darren and Dylan's gauges showed they had descended to 200.